All right, I have the pleasure to have uh, Anu from YC here. Um, Anu, uh, actually, if uh, I'll let her introduce herself even more in a moment, but she leads the YC Continuity Fund, which, so she's doing everything post-accelerator. Uh, so today we're going to talk about how to raise your Series A. So for the past hour, we've been very focused on going from zero money to maybe pre-A, right? And right now we're going, we're how to raise our A. So the next, just think a little bit later than we have for the past hour. Uh, so, uh, so why don't you just start out by introducing yourself um, and then talk a little bit about uh, the specifics of your investment, check size, geos, uh, that, things of that nature. Sure. So... Um, I'm a partner on the YC Continuity Fund. It's a fairly new fund. It was launched uh, only a couple of years ago, but it's still under the YC umbrella. And uh, the primary purposes of the fund is really to in invest growth stage companies. And what we mean by growth stage is, um, you know, you, you have strong product market fit and you've sort of figured out a playbook and you're raising money for scale. Um, because it's a growth stage fund, it tends to be, you know, roughly Series B and above, uh, not necessarily Series A. So there is sort of uh, this gap where when you come out right out of the accelerator, they actually, uh, you know, raise during the demo day that we uh, have. Um, and the idea of the fund was not necessarily just for investment. It was really uh, to help companies scale. So YC's early stage, the core program, actually does a fantastic job of teaching you how to start a startup. So even if you're noodling with the idea and you have you know, three to five people or maybe just two co-founders, you know, the early stage program um, teaches you how to get from there to 20 to 30 people in the company. How do you figure the product market fit? I think where there is a gap, which is what YC Continuity is trying to do is, you have a company with a strong product market fit, maybe 40 or 50 people, and you're trying to go to 200 or 300 people, the role of the CEO really changes, right? It's no longer about just product. It's about who do you hire? What should your senior exec team look like? So that's where YC Continuity plays a role. Right on. And to be clear, uh, I'm pretty sure you don't only invest in YC startups, is that correct? Yeah, so our core focus is YC. Okay. Uh, because why would it? Why would it? We have an awesome portfolio of right. startups, so that's where we spend most of our time. But nothing stops us from investing in non YC. Okay. Uh, can, what percentage of your startup, of, excuse me, of your investments are, out, are non YC startups? So, so far today, uh, all of them are YC. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. The first one will be from this audience here tonight, okay? We all have an objective. Um, um, does YC lead deals uh, at A and beyond, or are you always joining uh, in, in someone else's? So from uh, series, I mean, typically we don't do the traditional series A. We actually right. do uh, series B and above. So growth rounds Actually, can you explain why you don't do the A? Yes, so I think the primary reason we decided not to do the A was for uh, signaling purposes because we have 120 uh, companies uh, each batch. Uh, actually, I think we've run the math on this. Majority of them actually don't raise the Series A right, uh, right out of uh, the batch. Actually, they tend to raise around 12 to 18 months since demo day because they're still quite early, but they raise seed amount. But anyway, because that is, you know, that ha that was historically the core of YC and still is, um, you know, we didn't want any signaling risk of us cherry picking. And so therefore, the fund itself was also raised for a different charter, which was can we come up with a growth stage, uh, com you know, sort of program or community that helps scale CEOs. So our core focus, therefore, has been Series B and above. Right. Um, I don't remember. remember. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you uh, lead deals? Oh, yes. So, yes, we do lead or participate. So, growth rounds are really large. Uh, it's also not a zero-sum game. So, if you're raising a $400 million round, chances are you have more than one investor. In that case, if, you know, we may lead if it makes sense or we participate if it makes sense. So, I would say right now, of the investments we've made, it's pretty mixed. In some cases, we've led and in other cases, we've participated. Okay, okay. And how do you differentiate yourself from the Sequoias, the Benchmarks, the Kleiners, 
Uh, YC as a growth fund is, is very young, all right, just a few years old, whereas Sequoia and many of these have decades of experience and also reputation. So how does YC differentiate at this stage? Yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, the biggest uh, uh, pro there or the plus there is the YC platform, right? I mean, a lot of our founders uh, raised, you know, probably raised their first check from YC. And some of the companies probably wouldn't exist today if not for YC. So I think YC is uh, family first, founder first. We have a very strong community. As a growth stage continuity fund, what we try to do is actually uh, provide advice in scaling. So this is where um, I think we spend a lot of time with the founders in their growth stage, walking through who do you have your senior exec team today? Where are the gaps? What does it take to, to going to be two years down the line? Um, how you know how, how can you improve your hiring and recruiting practices? And the great part is we have a lot of growth state successful CEOs like Airbnb, Dropbox, Tribe. So it's not just, uh, you know, Ali and I, Ali is the other partner on the fund. It's not just the two of us teaching. Our other successful growth state CEOs actually spend a lot of time uh, with these CEOs on, you know, mistakes they did, lessons that they learned, and how to scale better. And it's not just the CEO, it's also the senior execs in those companies who spend time with the CEOs telling them, you know, why should you hire a person like that? And that's, I think it's the power of the community, uh, even at the growth stage, that really helps differentiate us. Right. And a key part of that community, of course, is v our VCs themselves, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, so how do you lead, you're, you're in some ways competing with Sequoia and the Kleiners and Dreesen. Um, how do you do this in a way that doesn't damage the relationship? Because of course, um, you know, the strength of, part of the strength of YC is the ability to help startups raise a significant round right after, after shortly after demo day at least, from many of these firms. Uh, so it's kind of a delicate balance that you yeah. have here. Um, so how do, you, how do you manage that? Yeah, actually it's not been, I mean, uh, it, it's not been that hard in the sense of we've done about 10, 11 investments. Most growth stage rounds are really large. For example, Instacart, right? We actually invested in their most recent round. Uh, we were one of the participants along with Sequoia. Um, I think they raised around three, two, 200 to 300 million. Um, and so you do see that in most growth stage rounds, uh, it's not a zero sum game. More often than not, you actually have more than one investor. And uh, second, you know, we don't do any Series A. So therefore, um, we actually come in much later and a larger portion of our portfolio is actually even more late stage. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have few Series Bs, but a lot of them are Cs, Ds, and Es. So those rounds are typically really large. Right. Uh, and just to be clear, everyone, she was also at Andreessen before YC, where you did do Series A deals. Um, so she does have uh, lots of experience on raising As, despite often focusing on B and later at this uh, at YC. And we also advise uh, a lot of our YC early stage when they raise their Series A. Of course. Of course, I believe you uh, taught how to raise a Series A to the last batch, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Right, so we, we have the right person in the chair right now. Um, so uh, let's talk about how does, let's, let's get right to it, uh, about raising a Series A. How does, uh, many people in this room, uh, we took a poll a moment ago, uh, has already raised a, a seed round. Um, what is the difference between raising a seed round and raising an A? What are some of the different dynamics that people should be aware of uh, when they're walking into their A having been successful at seed? Um, I mean, I think the investor base is different, right? Uh, there are very few institutional funds that do a, a seed, but when you're going to a series A, um, it's about running a process. Um, I mean, uh, it's about meeting uh, the firms and evaluating whether they are right partners for you. A lot of times, founders often do the mistake of thinking, oh, I just need to meet everyone, make sure that I convince them about the company, and then figure out who wants to invest. I think the mistake there is you should also be evaluating whether that investor is the right partner right. for you, because they're going to be on your board for more than 10 years. And so 
you know, you wouldn't do that decision lightly if you were choosing a partner. And I think that's the same weight you need to put in when you're uh, running your Series A process. So one is that it is a you know much more structured process than what a seed is. And so when I say run a process, it's more you know if you decide that you're going to raise your Series A and it's the right time, it's about meeting how many of our firms you want to meet. You know, typically uh, startups meet anywhere from eight to ten to twenty to thirty firms, right? But you all you do all those meetings pretty much in the same period because you want to choose the right investor for you, um, and so doing the meetings at the same time helps optimize for that. Um, second is, you know, you have you know as, as you know investors want to see how good a storyteller you are, and it's not because they're testing you for story selling skills. It's more. You know, are you able to articulate the vision very clearly? Are you able to convince them? Why? Because that's how you are going to hire your team. And if you can't convince your investors, then how are you going to convince the engineers who we are trying to recruit? So that's sort of what they're trying to figure out, which is why I would say more, firm, more often than not, firms require a deck. And so the deck is the arc of storytelling communicating what you're building, what has been the progress so far, and what are you going to do with that capital, right? So it's really three elements. And I often tell founders this, the, the first element is the team, right? You're still early, so why you? And why are you building this company? Why are you the right team to build this company? Second is product. So what have you learned from your seed round? Do you think you have product market fit or not? And what pain point are you really solving, right? What is the product really offering? And then the third step is use of funds. So you're raising for a reason. What do you plan to do with that raise? And work backwards from the next raise. So if you think you're going to raise, say, 8 or $10 million, how you need to have a plan on how long is it going to last and what milestones do you plan to hit with, that, with those dollars? Um, and so you work backwards from the next raise. Right. Uh, in the last session with Edith, uh, something interesting came up about the mistakes that are made at uh, raising an angel round that could affect your ability to raise a seed round. Uh, I want to ask the next stage of question to you is, what are the mistakes that are, uh, you often see entrepreneurs make in their raise at seed, whether it be terms or something on the cap table, that will hurt their ability to raise an A round? Um, I think the terms alone don't, are not a deal breaker if you really have a company uh, with strong product market fit and you're trying to raise your Series A, I mean, you will be able to raise. I think the uh, one important thing, if I had to point out, would be founder equity. So um, I think investors uh, really care about founder equity because you have, you know, you're going to, uh, you'll go through a lot of ups and downs. It's very hard. Startups are hard. And so the, the reason why they're paying attention to how much equity you have is, you know, that's a sign or a signal for whether you're going to commit yourself to stay. Uh, and so if you, you know, end up selling a lot of your equity and you don't have enough ownership in your seniors, that may be something that a CDC investor really pays attention to uh, because that's a sign of, you know, a, a question will raise in their minds as to is this person or is this team committed to actually building a great company. And related to that is co-founder equity. And I want to bring that up because especially I see too many founders or you know, at, at least in the early stages doing that mistake of where you may have three co-founders and maybe two of them are equally important to what you're doing, but then the founder has like disproportionately high equity. And so what's in it for the co-founder to stay? Right. Yeah, uh, actually, I believe YC generally uh, at the early stage recommends having equal co-founder mm -hmm. equity, even if one's CEO and one is VP of, of product. Or I mean, I think it really depends from a situation to situation mm -hmm. basis. But for example, if you're building an AI company and your co-founder is core for AI, uh, while you probably have domain knowledge and you have disproportionately more equity, then probably you're putting the company in jeopardy. Right, so you have to determine whether the co-founder is core uh, to what you're building and how you plan to scale because it's about lock term. It's not about optimizing for the first year. Right, right. Uh, a few minutes ago, you mentioned that even YC companies, many, I think you even said majority of YC companies don't raise an A at least shortly after mm -hmm. 
um, the demo day, uh, which I think probably comes at a surprise to some people. Many people probably, uh, I know I used to have the perception, oh, okay, YC, all YC startups raise an A after demo day. Um, and, uh, and that's definitely not the case. And in fact, I think research shows 70 to 80% of startups that raise a seed will never raise an A. They'll fail to raise an A, and that's a stat you'll hear in this event almost every, every month because uh, it, is, it is so important. And, um, and I think people don't expect the difficulty of raising an A. Do you have, what do you think are some general reasons that you see time and time again, uh, especially for, from YC startups that aren't able to raise an A, not just after demo day, but, but not able to raise an A at all? What are some the most common reasons uh, startups don't raise an A? Um, I think the main uh, reason why they may find it difficult to raise an A would be because maybe the product is not truly really solving a pain point or it's too niche a market and they don't have right product market fit and they may have burnt a lot of capital but not, you know, the product is really not taking off. Uh, that's usually the most uh, common reason as to why they find it difficult to raise an A because think of it this way, as an investor, if someone wants to put 10 million into the company for Series A, they want to see some signs of it working. So what does that mean, right? So let's take Airbnb as the example. Like what would someone as an investor in Series A wanted to see in Airbnb? I mean, they would have looked at, okay, all, the, all that Airbnb does is list homes and you rent homes, right? So the room night is the key metric uh, that Airbnb tracked. So a Series A investor is looking for, okay, is, there, is, it, is the product really working? How do you figure that out? Growth is the number one thing. So how is the monthly growth? If your product is really taking off, your monthly growth is going to be pretty solid. Um, you know, when I say solid, it's usually more than 15% month on month. Greater than 20% month on month is considered hyper growth. Um, and so those are signs that it's working, right? Um, the second thing they look for is, well, is it working because they paid to acquire users or is it organic? Because if they didn't pay and it was all organic, then you're truly solving a pain point because of which your product is taking off. In Airbnb's case, almost, I think they spent zero on acquisition of guests. Zero at the time of CZ. That's a very strong signal. Well, the product is really working. It's early signs. Now, you know, what was their GMV or run rate really varies. You know, if you have few million dollars, even low single digit million dollar GMV run rate, but all organic and you're growing healthy month on month, now you have the attention of a Series A investor because they go, wow, wow, if this company $8 million, they're really going to accelerate. And they, and they'll, st you still not figure out everything. You will still have to, you know, there will be other problems that come at scale. But you have something that's working, there's demand for it, and so um, they feel comfortable investing. And second is team. I mean, the, I would say first is team and second is product. Uh, but, you know, they also look at the team and evaluate, the, especially the founders and the co-founders, to, to figure is the team that I can bet on that they would go build. And to a large extent, your progress so far is also an indicator of that, right? Like if you have organic growth, which means you were really careful about the, uh, the way you spent your money. Uh, you really worked very hard to get the product to work. And that was true for Airbnb. They didn't have a product working for almost two and a half or three years. So they didn't raise their Series A for that long. Um, and so sometimes it takes longer, but it's worth spending little money to make sure that you really have a product that's solving a pain point before you go and raise uh, Series A capital. Right on. Let's uh, shift and talk a little bit about valuation and terms, because I think this is a lot of questions, uh, especially from first-time entrepreneurs, are, are about, the, about this. Um, so what are the, some terms that you see that founders um, often misunderstand? And which ones should they be most concerned about? And which ones should they ignore? So a few questions in there. Uh, but basically, which ones should they ignore? Which ones are most important? I think the two most important things are, uh, one is your own dilution and how much um, ownership uh, equity is the investor asking for. Okay. Uh, as I said, you know, I think it's very important for the founders and the co-founders to have enough equity to stay in the company and be committed long term. So you should care about what the dilution is. Uh, but I think founders too often either you know don't understand that and are 
and just you know don't pay attention to it. Or are at the other end of the spectrum, where they're too sensitive to dilution and therefore therefore are rising for the best valuation and not the best partner. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is a trade-off. You should uh, balance both. Ideally, make sure that you have enough equity um, uh, for for the entire founding team, not just yourself as the CEO, but also the co-founders, uh, so that you can stay committed, so that everyone will stay committed longer term, and optimize for picking the best best for not just the highest valuation. Right. Is there a maximum amount of the company someone a, a, a founder should sell at A? Yeah. I don't think there is a strict rule of maximum because it's it's really dependent on your traction. Um, the further along you are, the lesser dilution you have. Um, and on, at this stage, uh, for a series A, it's, the valuation is more art than science. Um, so for example, if you're really early and you're building an enterprise company, and you know, because early stages of enterprises, you usually have SMBs as customers, it takes a long time to get an enterprise contract, definitely not in your series A. And therefore, investors typically at that point are taking higher risk, so they may ask for 25 to 30% ownership in a Series A. So if you're raising you know, $5 million, it's literally five divided by 0.3, that's your valuation. There's no more science to it than that. Um, but if you're a consumer company and you have a lot more traction uh, and than normal, then you may be able to raise it at, say, 20% ownership dilution. So like the VC is asking for 20%. Um, so that's typically the 20 to 30 percent is where usually the range is. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes a little lower, depending on traction, because com sometimes company bootstrap for a longer time. Mm -hmm. uh, anything more than 30 percent is worth like asking yourself why is that the case. Got it. Got it. Uh, what are some methods that you, I mean, as the the investor, are using to define the valuation? You mentioned it's a little more art than science. From, from the investor standpoint, how do you arrive at evaluation? I, I, I mean, how much is it what the entrepreneur is demanding versus what your analysts are saying the company is worth? Yeah, so I think for Series A, it's really only ownership. Uh, it's not uh, looking at comms or saying, oh, SaaS companies trade at five times one year forward. Like, it doesn't matter because more, more often than not, uh, you know, at your Series A, you may have one million ARR. Right. So the bet is really that someday you'll be a very big company and, you know, is the market opportunity large enough that can we envision that this company will be a, at least a billion dollar company. Right. And so that's the test. And then the valuation is more uh, ownership because, it, you know, the investor is also taking huge risk at that stage. But when it comes to B and C and D, that's where... Um, you you look at comps. You look at um, you know how are companies trading in the public market, uh, especially looking at margin profile. Uh, how are other private companies uh, you know getting their valuations? Like what multiples did they get for what growth rates or for what margin potential? So I think that comes that element comes in more in the BNC. Okay, right on. And um, YC to, uh, is always very founder-friendly, founder, founder friendly, uh, and does a good job of kind of looking out for their own startups, and even, uh, to my understanding, has a kind of a database of VCs and with some kind of reputation information in there. Um, and you also will naturally see so probably some bad behavior by VCs and bad behavior regarding terms. What are some terms that you see that get put in by VCs sometimes that you want to kind of warn startups um, to be aware of? Any terms they should be uh, kind of be cautious about? Um, I think that, you know, having structure in your Series A is probably not a good sign. Asking for more ownership than what's uh, typical industry standard is the other. I would say that is the biggest one, you know, uh, because sometimes you may be seeing five million for the first time. And if it's, you know, if they're asking five at like a 40 percent ownership, sometimes founders don't realize that, you know, they actually can push back on that. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's the most common, I would say. Second is uh, looking at looking at sir or um, you, you know vetoing who would be on your board. You don't want to give up that. You want your board composition. Uh, you should be able to decide who you want on the board right. in subsequent rounds. 
those are things I would say you should definitely uh, pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And always, please show your term sheet to a GC or a lawyer before you sign it. Absolutely. There are enough um, you know, firms in the Valley who've seen so many term sheets from the same firm and they can advise you on what they normally do versus not. So I would definitely show it uh, to uh, you know get legal input before you agree to any terms. Right, and uh, she mentioned it twice, is about really being cautious about who, who gets on your board, right? Uh, you're, it's, it's a marriage of sorts for eight, 10 years and beyond. Um, it, it can be great, and it can also be a disaster. disaster. It's something to be very cautious about, as she said a couple times. Um, let's talk about uh, founder hustle. So um, you mentioned earlier, I think, uh, founders need to meet 20, 30 investors. Um, I've often heard founders tell me they're meeting with 50 investors. Uh, how much time does a CEO need to devote to fundraising, A? And B, how, if it is so much, how do they manage their company and continue to build product and continue that trajectory they have up until then while during the fundraising process? Uh, we advise our founders to at least have two months, uh, if not more, uh, especially if they're going to um, run a Series A process. And uh, even if you start with a list of 50 firms, you should um, have tiers. Tiers not just because you read, the, read about them on TechCrunch. Crunch. It should be because you know which individuals in those firms you want as partners. So I would even go to the extent of being more specific than just have the names. Have the particular general partner that you want, you would love to have on the board. And so shortlist the first five or seven that you think you would love to have on the board. Maybe because of their background or things, that, or maybe you've followed them for a while and you love the advice they've given or you've heard um, up from other founders about how helpful they've been on the board. And so tier your list into three or four phases. Start with the first tier where you know that you would work with any one of them if they gave you a term sheet and have them on the board. So start first you know, meeting them and get feedback from them. And you know, if you end up getting a term sheet from the first five or the first seven, then your process is really short, right? But if, if, if that doesn't happen, then go to the next set. Um, and also incorporate the feedback that you're learning. You know, fundraise can be a great, great uh, process of learning. Um, you know, many times uh, founders have, have told me this, especially the ones who've done it really well, that it has helped push their own thinking about where the company should head. It doesn't mean you change your vision statement, but like how you articulate the story. The gaps in your own vision are things that come up during fundraise pitch meetings. And so founders who do it well really learn from it, learn a lot from it. Um, ask, ask the investors questions too. Don't think this is a one-way process. Ask them for feedback on the company. Ask them what they truly think about the business potential. Ask them, you know, even ask them for customer intros if they think there are customers, companies in the portfolio that can you can use. So this is where I think you can use the uh, fundraise process also as um, an you know enhancement for one for learning. Even for you know building your own business, you may end up getting more customers uh, through the process, right? Enterprise companies, the CEOs who do this do this really well. They ask for customer intros. Uh, in fundraise meetings, and they almost always get it. So don't waste that opportunity. So in terms of coming back to your time uh, commitment, I think you should allocate six to eight weeks, if not longer. Sometimes it takes much longer for companies to raise. Um, and you know, in the meantime, having uh, will be helpful. So if every decision has to go through you, you may want to figure out a way to delegate a, a large portion of that during the fundraise process to someone else. Simply because meetings will come up, your calendar will get booked even if it's not booked, um, and you know there will be additional meetings each firm asks when they start doing diligence. So you just want to be prepared um, to make sure that you're dedicating time for the fundraise because that will be your priority. Mm -hmm. Right on. Um, when, uh, when founders meet with these 50 or so VC firms, a lot of times they'll get uh, a, a fair amount of positive response. They'll say, okay, I'm interested, send me a deck. Or they'll, they'll, uh, they'll hear, okay, uh, keep me updated. 
put me on your investor list. All sorts of answers that say, I'm interested, but I'm not ready to sign the check right now. Um, and then even some that say, and I've definitely seen this at Demo Day, um, where many startups, many investors will say, I'm good for the check. Uh, but then later on, they have a, the founder has a very difficult time pushing all those investors kind of down the funnel to where they're um, actually consolidating the round and getting them all on board. Do you have any advice on how to kind of consolidate the round, how to um, get investors to move faster effectively and make them kind of, um, I guess, herd the cats of sorts? Um, I mean, the, this, there's, there's a lot of article written on, you know, how to read a no from a VC or a maybe from a VC. Um, you know, my view is, look, you need only one true believer, especially in your Series A. You don't need five. So, you know, read, read the signs, but, you know, between those lines, if, like, someone is saying maybe someone's not getting back to you, um, you know, you can definitely nudge them. But you may also want to read the soft signs. Maybe they're not true believers, and that's okay. Um, you know, Airbnb has the famous story of how many people said no to them uh, in the early days. Almost every company has gotten many no's. Uh, I don't think anyone had a straight shot yes, ever. So I think that you should, that's why it's more important to spend time understanding and coming up with a strategy of who you want to meet is this an investor that really understands the business you are uh, working on or building on the space? Because if you find the right fit earlier on, the process is a lot more smooth. Um, versus if you go, let me rank to, you know, all the firms, and you're just hitting the top 50 because of the brand name, that's when the problem arises. So I think it's about finding the right partner and the right firm uh, that knows the space, and then if the others are not nudging, then you know probably the answer is they're not ready for it yet. Right on. You talked a lot about right partner. Uh, how does an entrepreneur pick the right partner? How do how does an entrepreneur do investor due diligence? Uh, are there platforms that you recommend to go learn about investors? How do you make sure that you don't get someone on your board that's um, going to really be difficult to get along with for a long time? Uh, how do we how do we do entrepreneur due, due diligence? Uh, we recommend back channel checks. You absolutely need to do that. Just the way the investor does founder checks, uh, founder reference checks, you should do the same. Uh, one, when uh, you get a Series A term sheet and you've decided to uh, accept the term sheet, it's perfectly fine to ask that investor who's coming on the board for references. And you should do those reference calls. And in those calls, you should ask the founders uh, questions about how they operate with the board member, what is their relationship, um, how are they when things were going well, and how are they when things were not going well, right? You need to know both of those. I would also recommend doing back-channel checks. So if there were you know, other portfolio companies that they didn't refer you to, try to meet those founders and ask them, um, you know, how, how, are, how are they on the board? Uh, and I think that's perfectly fine. You should do that. Uh, and I think I'm surprised by how very few founders ask for reference checks from board members. Okay. Um, let's go back to that stat earlier about how uh, many seed, uh, seed stage companies never make it to A. Um, I think one of the hardest decisions as a founder to make is that decision of when, when to call it quits, when to seek an exit. Um, maybe, uh, maybe the company hasn't been able to raise in, two, in over two years. Maybe they've multiple times tried to raise this A or uh, maybe they just seen their growth kind of stall out. Uh, what advice do you give to founders on when to call it quits? Uh, this is, uh, I say this, sometimes I just want to say it, it might be time to, to think of some other options, uh, but they're not coming to me, coming to me for that. I surely don't discourage them, but uh, what, uh, what advice do you have for founders uh, that should be maybe considering uh, some sort of exit plan or earlier exit than planned? Um, I mean, I think the answer to that is, like, as like, under you know best when you're hitting a wall. Um, you know, we often say, tell our founders, and I've seen our founders, you know, persevere at what they're building. And they, as founders, you know a lot more about the problem you're solving than any of us, because that's why you decided to start that company. Uh, but at some point, 
you know, maybe it doesn't make any sense. And I think the problem where I've seen founders make the mistake of, you know, where they fail to call it quits soon enough, sooner rather than later is especially when I call it the reality distortion field. Like everyone is telling you something that's clearly a problem, but you have absolutely no clue it's a problem. So let me give you an example. So I'm not going to name any company, but if you are, and this is not even particular to a company, but say, for example, if you're trying to, you know, in the on-demand space, there are lots of companies that were trying to do Uber for X, Uber for Y, Uber for Z. And uh, when you're in that space, you need a lot of cash to scale. There is no network effect. So scale is the only way you differentiate from competition. So how do you do that? You subsidize. Basically, you... You know, if it costs you 10 bucks, you tell the user, it's a pay only five bucks and I'll get it done for you. And of course you grow, right? Because you're just giving it 50% cheaper than anything. But you ju at some point, if you don't increase the price, you're not going to sustain. It's not, you know, negative gross margin at 30% at growth is just more negative. You know, and people, the founders sometimes don't realize that. And, and so at that point, if you're not able to raise money, then you probably are going to you know, run it to the ground. So that's where I would say if too many people are telling you the same thing, pause. Think about it. And then maybe you'll still say, no, I'm going to go at it. But at least pause. And try to reflect on why everyone's telling you that. And by the way, the fundraise process is actually a great signal for that. Because you are meeting lots of smart individuals who spend a lot of time in this space. And if everyone is giving you the same feedback, maybe they're all wrong, and often we're all wrong. I, I, I completely have to say that. But it's worth pausing and at least asking yourself, what am I missing that these people keep bringing up the same point? Right on. Well, that's uh, almost all the questions. I just have one question left, so we're going to take questions in just a moment. So get ready. Um, uh, with your question, and Ryan will come around with the mic. My last question is, um, uh, I know, uh, actually, we, we were just in Beijing together a few months ago, so I know Anu has a very international scope uh, of in, in philosophy of investment. However, most investors here in Silicon Valley just want to invest in, what, a 30 miles radius around Palo Alto, effectively. Um, what do you, uh, do you think more Silicon Valley investors should be looking internationally for deals or at least be more open in order to make sure they capture the next big returns? Uh, is, is now the time for investors to start thinking differently on international investing or is, you know, for many of them, is, is the right thing still just to be focused here on Silicon um, Valley entrepreneurs? Well, I think it depends uh, on firm by firm and what their philosophy is. But from YC, I would say, you know, we absolutely believe in the global opportunity uh, because, you know, tech is no longer just Silicon Valley. Uh, you can, uh, you know, there are great tech companies being built outside of Silicon Valley. Uh, I mean, China is a great example of that. I think, um, you know, there was some report that came out um, maybe a year ago. Don't quote me on this, but I think they did a... Uh, they did an analysis of billion dollar companies built in the last uh, five years or a decade. And 60% was Silicon Valley and 40% was China. So clearly, uh, companies are getting built everywhere. And I think Bangalore in India will also become an important node in that um, sort of triangle of where uh, tech companies get built. So I think YC's view very much is that there will be companies built everywhere. And uh, we want to help uh, help these companies build and scale. So we will help. We will do it for any company anywhere. So I think that I mean, last batch, forty percent of YC's uh, portfolio on the early stage was international, um, and we had companies from even Africa, India, uh, Brazil, Colombia. So we have a wide spectrum in terms of the companies that uh, come to YC. Hi, my name is Sangeeta, and uh, my company's name is Helpsy. We are focused on automating healthcare for clinicians. I have so many questions for you. <laughs> so uh, I'll ask three questions. You can pick which ones uh, you feel is uh, fast to answer. So first question is about reverse, um, what's it called, reverse vesting for the founders that sometimes like LSA and other investors will do. Uh, where your own equity vests over time as a founder. Um, so what do you think about that? 
Second question is uh, what I have thought about in this space with healthcare and companies not making it to Series A is to wait and not get the seed round, so do self-seed round and then go for Series A. So what are your thoughts about that? Um, and the third question is I find that in healthcare, it's great that we are starting to see investment and better understanding of the space. But disproportionately, most of the investors are doctors. While the healthcare space is so large and it has the largest number of people are nurses, there are nutritionists, there are all kinds of healthcare professionals who are underrepresented and not well understood in their utilization of healthcare. So uh, let me clarify the third question. Is the, is the question that most investors are doctors or is it most companies are catering to doctors? Uh, no, most investors are doctors, and I think sometimes they don't understand the full value of what other people in the healthcare bring. So, for example, I'm an engineer and an oncology nurse. So sometimes people think, well, you should have an oncologist, but they don't do the work that I do, and I'm trying to build a solution for nurses. So, Yeah, I think I would be surprised if... Um it continues, I'll start with the third question. I would be surprised if it continues down that path because I think, you know, um, a lot of firms are spending a lot more time in healthcare. Healthcare is um, the next biggest vertical where I think tech can make a huge change. Uh, we're already seeing, um, you know, a lot of uh, companies, for example, YC's first biotech company was a synthetic biology startup. Uh, Ginkgo Bioworks, which is based out of Boston. Uh, so think about how they got funded, <laughs> right? No one, these were five MIT PhDs who started the company. So um, I think that that's definitely changing. So I don't think that would uh, continue to be the situation. I, I, I think there are already enough investors who actually um, do invest in um, different areas of healthcare. Uh, there's definitely a learning curve in that space, but I think um, there's definitely there's interest and there is momentum as a result of which I think it'll only help accelerate. Um, in terms of seed versus, uh, you know, should I do a sell seed, raise the seed? And I think this would be a, and that's related to the vesting terms and everything. I think, look, if you are building a company where you just need a little more time to get that product market fit, Take that time, don't raise the extra money. You know, too often people think that if I put more people at the problem, the problem will get solved. It doesn't happen. More people at the problem only makes the problem worse. Um, and I always use the example of Pinterest uh, and Ben Silverman where he actually spent the first three years really trying to get that pin board working so that it would resonate with people. And that means you need only four people working on it, or three. You don't need 10. And that means you don't need to race, and that's OK. But once it took off, uh, and he was able to find enough of a user uh, growth traction, he was able to raise seed. But there is the whole story behind how difficult it was for Pinterest to raise even seed money. Um, you know, that's, That may not be true for certain types of startups where you need a lot of money. Uh, for example, I think um, Netflix could not have used that approach. I think the DVD business and a lot of capital was what helped them pivot to the streaming business. But surely Facebook, Pinterest, um, I would say even Dropbox uh, in the early days because it had the consumer, it was primarily a consumer app, uh, had all flavors where you really could tweak the product till you found that product market fit uh, before you went out and raised money. Now, you may need a million or you may need 500K depending on where you are, uh, but that's a lot better than saying I, I need five million. Um, and so I think it's more important to make sure that uh, you feel like you are really uh, building a product that's solving a pain point that has a big market opportunity. This is where I would refer to Peter Thiel zero to one. You know, he, uh, he has this famous saying in the book that make sure you're, you're building something zero to one that has the potential to go from, from there to one to many, if not work for a company that's doing that, right? Because, and I think the longer you spend on it, you'll know whether you have a huge market opportunity. 
Thank you for sharing your insights, both of you. Um, I'm Sherry Duville. I'm CEO of Metagram, also a healthcare startup. So we are saving lives by getting information instantly there right now for physicians and care teams. We've got a full stack platform, uh, which is a little bit unusual. So it's like a private vertical cloud. And so my question with fundraising has more to do with, you know, optimizing how you spend your time because, you know, you were talking about product, customers, team, and then also fundraising. And, and, and to her point, I, I don't know that I'll know that all 30 people that will be appropriate for our space, both for the mobile enterprise aspect and the healthcare aspect. So if we found a partner that we enjoy, that we think has the right expertise and skill set to work with, what is your recommendation in terms of bringing their their colleagues over the line? So, with, so say you've been through not really a process, but you've kind of figured out who you'd like to work with and, and you want to know, you want to kind of uncover, you know, how to get the firm on board, yes. building consensus. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, usually the, in most firms, the way it works is if you have one partner who is a true believer, they sort of become the sponsor for your, you know, that particular investment opportunity. Um, and it's also... Uh, their job to convince the rest of the partnership and your job. So I'm not saying the onus is on them. The onus is on both of you to work together to make that happen. Uh, and so this is where having a really tight story is extremely important. Uh, you know, I would say like a really tight button-down deck which talks about the team, the product, what it really solves, the roadmap of the product, if you have metrics, the metrics have to be really, really crisp and clear, communicating the value prop of the product and what you plan to do with the race. Um, and many times the all partner meeting, when you have the all partner meeting and you're presenting, other people have different questions. Now, what the reason why firms do this all partner meeting is not because you have to go convince them. It's because the person who is sponsoring the investment opportunity is, is probably really sold or is pretty much leaning towards doing the investment. So the reason you meet the rest of the partnership is to see is, you know, they may be biased and they may not be uh, really evaluating all the risks. And so the purpose of the rest of the partnership is to A, confirm that the strengths are true because of which the partner is excited about, and B, to really poke holes to understand do you, have they really evaluated all the risks, right? So you should use, I mean, just like you would do the first pitch, it's about, um, you know, the second pitch or the all partner meeting is also, you know, for you to get to know the rest of the firm and, you know, even though you may have one board member, there might be expertise of other partners that will be helpful to you along as you scale the company. So it's a way for you to get a sense for, do you also have a fit with the firm? Although more important is the fit with the partner, but still the second importance is that. And third, to really pay attention to what questions they're asking, because sometimes you also, also may thought through all the risks, right? So that process just helps you uh, further improve your own thinking. My name is Dimitri, I'm the founder of Pictabite. When you were talking about the cost of Series A, you mentioned that there's a range between 20 to 30 percent, depending on uh, a few factors. But what struck me was that you didn't mention that there is a correlation between how much how much money you're trying to raise. Yeah. That it seemed like you know Series A is just 20 to 30 percent. So if, if that's the case, um, is it a bad idea to try to raise as much money as we need uh, to avoid unnecessary dilution and just try to raise as much as possible? Is that not going to have any effect on how much equity we lose? Yeah, great, uh, great question. So um, I think most investors will be hesitant to give a lot of capital in Series A simply because, um, you know, uh, unnecessarily it puts the company at risk. And this is where I really want to spend time. Another common mistake the founders do is because they think, oh, I can raise 20 million and 20 divided by 0.3 is my valuation. Now just imagine you did that and your valuation is really high. Now, 15 months later, you have to go and raise your Series B, or 18 months later. Because when you have more money, two things always happen, always. I've never seen a company with an exception. You spend more than required, and you do more experiments than needed, and almost all of them fail. And you will, you will run out of money in 15, 18 months. Now you go and you raise. What are you gonna, what's gonna happen? You haven't, you don't have traction. 
that proves that you deserve the evaluation that you got in Series A. And so inevitably, you put yourself at risk and the company at risk of raising a down round. And that just hurts the morale, your recruitment, and a lot of other factors. And so I think it's very important that you pay attention to the valuation yourself. Even if someone offered you a crazy valuation, the great CEOs do walk away from it because they know that they need to set themselves up for the next round. Um, and so I think it, it, it is a function of the money you raise, but the valuation is really important. I'm Narajan from, uh, from PI. I'm in the enterprise IoT space. I have two questions. Um, does it make a difference to have one Series A investor or have two investors coming for the Series A round, two or more? And um, the second question is, um, what do Series A investors expect to achieve, to a company to achieve in terms of milestone uh, in the use of proceeds? For example, is it a revenue goal, is it a break-even goal, or some other goal? Um, the first question is, can there be more than one investor in Series A? Yes, absolutely. So first of all, I think depending on who you raised money from in your seed, you have something called pro rata. Um, and so your existing investors may also want to invest some portion. And then you could potentially get one other investor um, you know, as a minority ownership versus someone else takes the major ownership. It's not that common, but it happens. And it happens probably more in enterprise and healthcare than, say, in consumer. Um, because there are valid reasons for why you may need it from two investors. Uh, your second question, I forgot the second question, sorry. Oh. Yeah, so in terms of milestones, honestly, the investor is really looking at the, the founder, the CEO, to tell them what it is. And they want to, they, it has, I, I think the only check they're doing is, is that achievable? Is that believable? Can they actually get there? Uh, whether it's revenue, whether it's growth, whether it's, you know, it all depends on the product. So if you're an enterprise company and, you know, you already have an, you're selling some and, say you have one million ARR, then they're really paying attention at what will your revenue goal be. Um, if you're a consumer company and you're not monetizing, uh, but you have active users, then they're looking at goals like what is your monthly active user going to be? Uh, or if it's a marketplace, they're probably paying attention to GMV. But it really depends on what is the product. If it's a hard tech company, like, you know, Vicey has a ton of them, like Rigetti, Quantum Computing, Boom, Supersonic Jets. There, it's really about capital allocation and milestones. Like, okay, six months ago, you said you, we could build this chip. You know, are they on track to do that? So, so I think it really depends company to company, but what the investor is looking for is for the CEO to have a clear view. Because the test there really is, okay, if they get five million or eight million tomorrow, do they have a plan? on how to use it, and do we believe in that plan? That's really the two questions they're asking. Um, my name is Lala Zhang. I'm the co-founder of an ad tech company called Learning Genie. Uh, we're focusing on personalized learning for the early childhood education space. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the insight. I'm learning a lot. I'm getting a lot of my problems solved. Um, my question is, you mentioned that the team is most important. Uh, what are the criteria the investor in, uh, evaluate the team for Series A? Um, uh, especially for those ground, uh, grassroots founders that has big dream, big vision, and can execute, but uh, don't apparently seem to be um, having the experience, their background, or success stories that um, in front of investors, like maybe Airbnb founders, fall through that kind of uh, situation too. Thank you. Yeah, I think that uh, you know. People are not looking at just like your resume or your bio. It's more what is motivating you to build what you're building. Um, and so 
you know, there's like different things investors look at. One is, you know, widely talked about as idea maze, which is walk me through the journey of why you arrived at this idea and what is the insight you have that no one else has because of which you are the right person to build this. Um, you know, at YC, you know, we read 7,000 applications each batch and pretty much most of them are really, really early. So, but I think, uh, you know, I'd like to think that YC is really good at picking founders. And one of the tests we do is that, is exactly that. Like, what is it about the space or the product that they're building that this is the right person? So often in interviews, we actually learn so much from them about what they're building because they have really spent a lot of time either research, research or it was a personal problem they had. Um, you know, it, it's true as usually in the case of enterprise and healthcare where they were working at a company and they experienced that. Um, or you have experienced it in some form and you really want to change that, right? So I think it's that idea maze. In some cases, it may be domain knowledge, like, you know, in the case of Ginkgo Bioworks, which was a synthetic biology startup. It was part of something that they worked in their PhD. And so it made sense as to why they were building what they were building. So, um, you know, it really depends from startup to startup. Uh, but it's one is idea maze, in some cases domain. Third thing they're really trying to measure, but very hard, is grit. Because there's no doubt you're going to have a lot of ups and downs. So the one way to really get that is... You know, some investors, and especially this was true at Andreessen Horowitz, which I really appreciated, was, you know, they would really spend time figuring out, they'll say, start from very early, where did you grow up? <laughs> right? And I think part of the reason why you start that, they want to get all the information from them is they are trying to pay attention to um, how, how, what, tr how do you, what triggers your decision making? And uh, what decisions did, have you done in life that seemed contrary to most people? And you know, what motivated you to make those decisions? So those things teach you a lot um, and tells you about the person you are as well. Uh, you know, at YC, for example, in the application, we ask a specific question. Talk about a hack you did very early on in your life that's not related to this company. And uh, you'll be surprised at what we learn. Um, in fact, one of the things we talk about is in the uh, Airbnb interview uh, when they had applied. I think what really resonated was the fact that to keep Airbnb alive, they actually repackaged the cereal boxes and raised money. It had nothing to do with Airbnb, but it was to keep the company alive. That was the hack. But that's a sign of perseverance. They were not going to give up. Uh, and so those are the signs that, you know, investors are looking at. Hi, uh, my name is Njavam Tambo, and I am CEO of Musanga Logistics, a platform that, from that on a mission to transform the way millions of Africans transport products. I noticed that a lot of African startups are getting to YC, so that's great. But my, my question is, how do you support startups that are in Africa or Asia Africa in this case, um, do you have insight on markets, on how do you basically find the expertise to help startups that are serving different markets from the US? Yeah. So I think on the early stage side, um, you know, a lot of the company building challenges that a startup faces are pretty common. Uh, at least that's the experience we've uh, seen with the companies so far uh, that have gone through the program. Uh, they also benefit um, from learning from U.S. startups. Uh, and, um, you know, some of the, you know, like how to grow your user base. How you do it locally might be a little different, meaning, you know, some of the startups in the U.S. will use Facebook and maybe in Africa you don't. But I think the drive towards what kind of hacks to use and lessons learned definitely exist. And we've seen even startups in Africa sort of leverage that. I think the second biggest thing is in the batch and the alumni network of YC, you have access to a lot of the startups, uh, which in case you want market-specific advice. But to be honest, more often than not, we've actually seen that these companies benefit more from the company building advice. And that has been uh, something that founders don't expect coming in, but are more than pleasantly surprised as they leave the program. 
Um, and also these companies have been able to raise successfully out of demo day as well. So I think uh, the benefits you get of being as a US startup are also things you get from for an international startup. Uh, hi, my name is Stephen Lamb. I'm a co-founder of Zebiotics, which is a synthetic biology company. Okay. Um, okay. And my question is about if you're going into your second round, uh, is the mic not on? Oh, sorry, thanks. Uh, if you're going into your second round, what sensitivities should you be aware of uh, regarding your prior investors if, say, you want to diversify your investor base, um, whether you approach them first, how to do that, uh, anything on that topic? Um, yeah, I think it, um, you know, for every answer I'm going to probably say it depends, but um, it's probably, you know, more of more companies, not less, uh, I would say probably tend to raise from a different investor for various reasons because, um, you know, companies are only staying private longer. Median tend to go to IPO is 11 years now. So therefore, you may need to continue to raise capital. And so having, uh, you know, a few more investors with deep pockets is probably more helpful. Uh, but then it has to be the right partners. And so when you are in your Series B stage, right, you may be looking for different type of advice. And also some diversity of thought on the board is gonna probably help you as well and help the company. Um, so therefore, I think more often than not, companies tend to raise, raise from investors. Um, yeah, I think like, you know, in some cases, uh, existing investors may choose to double down, that happens too. Uh, but over the life of the company, it's probably good to have a few um, sort of diverse uh, ideas and thoughts on the board in your board composition. Hi, so my name's Helen and I'm a legal futurist with Singularity University. My question is based on your own experience. Does a business really need a problem po proposition? I'm asking that question looking at businesses that don't, for instance, um, businesses that sell tickets to Mars. Uh, I'm looking at um, video games or potentially apps. Um, which is pure entertainment. It doesn't add to society in, in, apart from having fun as a consumer. So I'm just curious, how do you value that as opposed to really impactful uh, businesses, say, like synthetic biology or DNA or pharmaceuticals? Thank you. Um, I think as uh, investors, you know, you're looking at really startups that are fundamentally changing the way things are being done today. So sure, in terms of, you know, people would argue that even about Facebook. It's like, oh, I log in every day and see my friend's feed. But I think it's not, um, you know, I actually think Facebook has actually changed, the, changed many people's lives because it did make the world really connected. I found a lot of my, I mean, this is one example, but I found a lot of my friends in undergrad who I went to school in India. And, um, you know, I don't think, I don't think I'm able to keep in touch with all of them, you know, more than 6,000 miles away without Facebook. So I just think that it really uh, varies, like the perception. Uh, with video gaming, I'm no gamer, but, you know, a lot of gamers love Twitch, right? And so as an investor, I think, um, we can't block ourselves to who we are and decide to invest in companies that only make sense to us. So uh, we spend a lot of time really understanding what pain point do they solve for the core demographic, which is their core user base, right? And I think, um, you know, lots of platforms uh, start actually with, the, uh, with gaming and then evolve into bigger use cases. So, um, I think as investors, we pay attention to every vertical. Uh, there is definitely more interest in hard tech these days because I think, you know, even even a day ago, you could argue that tech was only tech, and there were internet companies being built, um, and you know, you know, it was the app revolution with the iPhone. Uh, but now, tech is no longer just tech. Tech is disrupting every industry. We have tech in healthcare. We have tech in financial services. We have. Uh, tech disrupting, you know, through synthetic biology, um, tech even in textiles, right? Uh, the way a fabric is made is changing. And I think the uh, investors are paying attention to that as well and changing their style of investment accordingly. Vandana Upadhyay, I'm co-founder of an enterprise software SaaS company. 
Uh, my question to you is, if you are a startup like Workday, which was a very successful enterprise SaaS company, IPO'd, uh, their average revenue per customer is a quarter of a million dollars. But it took, they were in development for five years. After that, they probably got their first beta customer. And then I think they launched in the seventh year, if I recall correctly, the founders interview in Forbes. So if you are a startup like that, how do you win customers' mindset where they are trained to look for, you know, 50,000 MRR for a SaaS business, for example. And then that doesn't, you know, that plateaus out, so you don't see the growth. And here I have a customer where my customer revenue, the lowest could be million dollars or more. But it's going to take time because these are very big companies, $10 billion companies, $30 billion companies that are going through very long-term strategic view of where they want to go. And my solution is going to get built into where their strategy is going. Yeah, so I think that's true for a lot of enterprise companies, right? So some of them probably start with SMB, and that's probably why they have some revenue traction. But it's still, they go through the struggle, which is you know famously called crossing the chasm, right? So going from SMB to the first enterprise customer is always a challenge. And then even when you start getting few enterprise customers, uh, you know, you first run pilots, uh, it takes a longer sales conversion cycle, your sales team has to change, uh, you need to now hire a different head of sales, uh, your sales processes and infrastructure might need to change. I think it, you know, you know, many price companies go through it. Now, I don't know if they all go through the scenario you're describing, which is they don't have any customer for five years and then sort of win the first enterprise customer. I would say at least at the YC portfolio, um, we at least more recent startups, we haven't seen that. I think more often the problem with them is uh, they all start with startups as the customers. Then they gravitate towards like medium-sized startups. Then it may be slightly scale startups. And now you're all, they're all of a sudden signing a contract with a Creighton Barrel or an Oddstorm or an Eman Marcus or um, even Cisco for that matter. And they don't know how to negotiate with them or what you know what to set up. Um, and so there is a pain in that growth. Uh, and but the good news is you have uh, you know investors are used to that. They have seen it. It's, you know, no enterprise company uh, went like a straight curve. And, you know, they all went through those challenges. And there are a lot of execs in the Valley who also helped do that transition, right, where they had to come into a startup and sort of help uh, navigate that shift from an SMB uh, to an enterprise account. Uh, so to answer your question, like, I think are investors familiar with it? Absolutely. I think many enterprise startups go through that. All right, last question. Hi, thank you guys. Uh, my name is Joseph Douglas. I'm the CEO of Anti-Gravity Industries. We're an electromagnetic levitation and control system company. Um, my question is on the subject of deep tech. Um, a lot of times venture investors in the Valley have short cycles for their fund and short cycles in which they invest and expect an exit. But deep tech companies don't work like that. So how would you advise um, seed and A level companies um, to communicate uh, the, the timeline and, and the importance of managing that timeline to these new investors who may not be familiar with the space? Uh, if you asked me that question eight years ago, I would say it's a problem. I don't think any fund is seeing any exit right now. I, I, you know, the median time uh, to go IPO is 11 years. It's not uh, slowing down. And I think uh, there's enough capital in the private markets that most companies stay private longer. So it's actually not true that investors are... Uh, looking for a short exit. Now, I don't know if you're looking for a horizon of longer than 11 or 12 years. Okay, so that's most investors, um, you know, mo uh, almost all VCs in the Valley are completely comfortable with a 10-year exit. I mean, they raise funds uh, wi with a 10-year life or longer. I mean, uh, YC's um, first exit pretty much was Cruise, Airbnb, Dropbox, Stripe, none of them. None of them have exited. So I think investors are more than comfortable, um, you know, as long as you're building a long, sustainable, and durable company. All right, great. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Anu. Thank you, Barrett. Thank you, Edith. <laughs>